It is so good to be with you this morning, and uh, even with the basketball uh, goal in the middle of the auditorium, and uh, it is at the right height for me to dunk away, <laughs> and so I'm excited about that. The joke made about me being able to dunk after services, and, and man, I can hit that one. I guarantee you, I look good in the air, so uh, <clears throat> it is uh, so good to have you all here with, uh, uh, with us this morning, and so I have several things on my mind. I want to try to get through all those and, and share with you. Um, we are in the book of John, and we're going to be in chapter 4 is where we're going to start in just a few minutes. Um, uh, John chapter 4, this is 43 and following, but uh, I'm going to kind of jump back a, a little bit and give you a few details, and then we'll, then we'll jump into John chapter 4, verse 43. Uh, a couple of things that I want to mention this morning is uh, John Mullins is in the hospital and he has uh, had a, a bleeding spot on his brain. And so he is, uh, uh, it's been a struggle for him the last few days. And so uh, he is accepting visitors at the hospital there. So if you have a chance to go and encourage him, uh, do that. Take that opportunity. Serve by being an encouragement to someone who is, is struggling. And uh, uh, love on Melissa and Ella and and let them know how much that they as a family mean to us. Uh, one of the other things I want to ask you to do is, is keep uh, Mel Staley in your prayers. And um, uh, her cancer is uh, terminal, and uh, so we don't know how long she has. Uh, along with that, Heather has been taking her daughter, who is living with her, has been taking a lot of time off of work. And she has got to return to work. So we are looking for people. If, if you can just go spend four to six hours or so with Mel during the day, just sit with her so she's not alone. And, and uh, she, she's doing well enough that she can pretty much take care of herself. You might have to give her a hand, help her out of her chair a little or something. So uh, some simple things. There's, there's nothing difficult there. It's just her not being alone. Heather is afraid of her being alone. So uh, if you can volunteer in that way, please let my wife right down here know, Janine. And she'll take your na uh, name and number and we'll get uh, a schedule laid out and get with you and, and see what days are convenient for you. Uh, I also want to mention, uh, please keep Bob DeVoe in your prayers as well. He's make it, made it to services a couple of times, but uh, his disease is, is a long-term uh, disease, but it will eventually take his life. And, and so we want to keep Bob in our prayers. We want to... Uh, you know, send him notes, keep in contact with him, and let him know that we care about him uh, as he struggles with the disease uh, in the days ahead. Uh, that being said, I also have a thank you card here from uh, Dell and Walter. Uh, Lee Newkirk passed away uh, last weekend, and, and her service was this last week, and they wanted to just say thank you so much for your cards and letters and, and being there for them. And, and uh, Dell and Walter, we love you, and we're glad that you're a part of this family, and and uh, whatever you need in the future, we want to be there for you as you struggle through the loss of your mother. And uh, we hold our hope, you know, of being all together once again in the future. And that's an incredible thing for us to focus on as a family. All right. Now, last week we had uh, announced some new members, the Woods, which are sitting, they're sitting right here in the center. If you haven't had a chance to, to get to visit with them, please take an opportunity to visit with them. Also this morning, uh, I have the privilege of announcing... Uh, Michelle Luton and Dot Tebow sitting right back over here are placing their membership here with us as a congregation. And so yeah. we are excited about you being here and being a part of this loving family. And, and uh, it's a reminder this morning of the, uh, the way the auditorium looks with the bookshelves and everything else. Man, this is the perfect place for imperfect people and imperfect situations, right? Uh, life is not perfect. Uh, things come and go, difficulties come and go, machines break down, cars break down, uh, houses have to be repaired. Nothing ever stays the way it started, right? Uh, there was a time when I probably really could nearly, nearly, not, I'm not saying I could, nearly dunk a ball, but that day has come and gone, and uh, uh, the body uh, only allows me to do certain things, you know, we uh, I, I want to say thank you for letting us be on vacation this last week. We went over to Colorado and, and hiked through uh, the Pueblo Indian Ruins and Mesa Verde National Park. And, and uh, we stopped in a place uh, called Capulin, New Mexico, and there's a volcano there. 
And uh, uh, we had been hiking for several days, a lot of miles, and Janine and I had been preparing for that. You know, we did really, really well till we got to the volcano. And the wind was literally so strong, you had to lean and walk like this, you know. And uh, we started up or up the side of the volcano, and we were going to go around the caldera. And, and Janine and I just said, no, we're just going to watch the boys do that. So Caleb and Preston took off and hiked all the way around the rim of the volcano, which is about a mile or so. And, and uh, Janine and I just sat and watched them, you know. And, uh, uh, but we had a, an incredible time. And uh, uh, we did hike down into the volcano and back. And, and, uh, but in that, you know, you, all, you have all these things that occur through a vacation. And, and it's a reminder always, no matter how much you plan, no matter what's going on, that imperfect situations occur, right? But in that, we were allowed to, to slow down and look. And, and uh, we took some pictures between the four of us that look like they're postcards, you know, and um, the beauty of God's creation reminds us of His power and His love for us, that He would give us such incredible places. And so uh, it's always a a pleasure. Uh, It's always enjoyable to get away. It is always an incredible pleasure to return home. Uh, We enjoyed services last week with the family at Cortez, New Mexico, and and uh, the lesson that the uh, uh, preacher there gave was a great lesson, and, but it's still always good to come home to be with family. And so um, if you're visiting with us this morning, we want you to know we really do feel like this is a perfect place for imperfect people to worship a perfect God, and we want you to be a part of that. Just, just let us know. Grab one of the men you see at the back or, or uh, grab me uh, or raise your hand uh, when we give an invitation song in a few minutes. And, I'll be glad to come to you and visit with you about being a part of this congregation. God has blessed us in so many ways. And and, uh, as we dig into the Word this morning here in in John chapter 43, there's a couple of things that I I want you to be aware of. John, John is writing to us, of course, from John 20, 31, we know. He says, but these things are written that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. And that's an important thing. But he writes to us and he kind of jumps. He, it's, not, it's not as John writes, you know, all this occurred in Jerusalem. And, and I, I want to remind you of the fact that, matter of fact, in these first four chapters, we, we see him go from Galilee to Jerusalem and back to Galilee. It's about 80 mile trip. Uh, from Galilee to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem back to Galilee. And so we're talking about numerous days, numerous hard travels, things that are occurring uh, around them. And uh, here in chapter 4, beginning in verse 43, we're going to see a gentleman who walked 17 miles to meet with the Savior. And that's important for us to know and understand uh, before we get into the lesson this morning. Um, A couple of things that I want to share with you about Jesus. And the first one that comes from Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. Seeing the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep. Without a shepherd. Luke 4 18, Jesus uh, reads about himself to the synagogue there. It's the beginning of his ministry, and he reads these words The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of of the Lord's favor. And so as we look at these things, one of the purposes of our Savior was to change people's lives, to give back to them, not just physically, but spiritually. And so we want to keep that in mind as we begin to look at these verses together this morning, that Jesus' plan, the plan of the Father, was for Him to physically change lives sometimes, but the ultimate goal was a spiritual change that the physical would lead to a spiritual change. 
And we understand that as, as His children this morning. So John chapter 4, beginning in verse 43, follow along with me. And after two days, He left Galilee. Now Jesus Himself had pointed out that a prophet has no, uh, no, law, no honor in His own country. Matter of fact, this comes from Matthew chapter 13, about verse 53, uh, down through 57. And he says, a prophet has no honor, not only in his own town, but in, in, or in his own town, but in his own home. And we see that. We understand that, right? Uh, it's funny. The way people are sometimes, you know, if you, if you had a nephew that became a physician, you would automatically change and start going to him, right? No, we're, we're not that kind of people. We, we, we think our doctor's the best and we trust him. We're going to stay with him. And, and uh, you know... We, we know what that kid did when he was 12 years old. I'm not going to him as a doctor, right? And then the same way you, you take a young man who's gone out and he's, he's passed his series six and 63 in his series seven, uh, that's all uh, uh, mutual funds and stocks and bonds. And he becomes a, a, a financial advisor and he's gained all this knowledge. And, and, and if it, it, let's say it's your niece this time and she's really sharp, you know, but we, we remember she failed that biology class in high school. I'm not giving her my money to invest. And because that's, that's the way we think. We don't, when we know people's fallacies, we don't trust them even in an area that beco they become an expert. And how do you become an expert? You have to live 50 miles away. <laughs> Did you know that? It doesn't matter how much. You know what? We could, we could have a guy sitting here with three PhDs, and when he, he, could, he could preach a lesson, and we go, oh, yeah, that was pretty good. And then six months later, some guy comes in who, who only, who's never done anything and really, but he's a good speaker, and he comes in to fill in, and he's filling in, in the pool, and he preaches the exact same lesson, but it's going to sound different, right? I tell you, that, you know what? If Matthew and I preach the same exact lesson, in similar shirts, it would not, you wouldn't think it was even the same lesson, I promise you. And you look at Matthew and say, man, he is good, just like I do. Yeah, Keith's okay. But Matthew, he is good. Because we're, we don't hear him every Sunday. We, we, when we hear someone new, when they come in from a distance, we label them as an expert. And the reality is, sometimes I've heard experts speak, and uh, they really are just a spurt. <laughs> but it's all about our own concepts. We have our own barriers. And Jesus understood that. And John is, John is referencing back to Matthew chapter 12 and 13. Matthew chapter 12, the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to him and they challenge him. They want to see a sign. And he, he says, you guys are evil because of that. And so that's what John is referencing here. All right, one more time. After two days, he left for Galilee. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no, uh, no honor in his own country. And when he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. We read earlier, just a couple of weeks ago, about him being in Galilee, that he, he healed many while he was there, and now he is returning. They know the story of what he's done in the temple. We took a look at that two weeks ago, him overturning uh, the money changers' tables and running people out, out of the uh, courtyard of the uh, uh, Gentiles, and, and he was a world, he was physically a world changer for the people that he was coming into contact with. But they wanted more than that. They wanted to see signs that he was doing, the miraculous signs. Verse 46, once more he visited Cana in Galilee where he had turned the water into wine and there was a certain royal offici official whose son lay sick in Capernaum. So this man's walked 17 miles, about 17 miles, to find Jesus for his son. And you know, I wonder, was his son, how old was his son? Was he four years old? Was he five years old? Was he 35 years old in the prime of life? Maybe he had a, a career and a job and something suddenly has put him on his deathbed. 
And when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. And now there's, there's, some, there's some discussion about this here. Is he talking to this man? And I don't think so. I think some of the scholars are right. And he's talking to those who have gathered around. Because they know what Jesus has done. They know how He's changed. They know the miracles He's performed. And they're there to see a miracle again, right? It's like when we all go to the circus, we want to see something extravagant, right? We come, we want to see something... You know, they didn't have any movies. They didn't have any radio. They didn't have any cards. They didn't, young people, they didn't have any video games. Man, that was difficult. And so they're looking for entertainment. And they come, they want to see Jesus do, uh, change the water to wine. Make somebody who's lame walk in. They want to see something spectacular. And he answers them, verse 48, unless you, you people see signs and wonders... You will never believe. And the royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied. Your son will live. And I hope you have this underlined in your Bible. The man took Jesus at His word and departed. He took Jesus at His word and departed. Verse 51, And while he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. And when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time in which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and his whole household believed this was... The second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judah of Galilee. And so we see this father, and I I want you to take a moment to think about this picture. He knows his son is dying. He hears that Jesus is coming. The man who performs miracles. And he, Lord, please come, come to where my son is. Come heal my son. Don't allow my son to die. And we read these words in in the Bible and the way it's written sometimes and we forget the emotion that is behind the circumstances that has just taken place. Lord, I don't want to lose my... Please, please come. Go, your son will live. And instead of continuing to plead... He turns, taking Jesus at His word, and He walks away. And for the other people that are standing around, and even the apostles, it's just a moment. It's just a short conversation. Lord, come heal my son. Go, he'll live. And off he goes. And they don't even know his name. And as he walks mile after mile home, wondering, am I going to find my son dead? No. He took Jesus at His word. Don't worry about tomorrow. I will provide for you all you need for life and godliness. And we read these things and we still go about worrying. We still wonder what's going to happen. We still continue. How many times over and over again I prayed the same prayer over and over and over and over again, knowing that it's a godly thing, knowing that I've asked for something that is right, something good to happen, and yet, why can't I be like the man who came to Jesus and said, Lord, this is what I want? And the Lord says, you can have it. Go. And do I turn and depart to receive what He has promised. The kingdom of heaven is like a pearl of great price or a treasure that is hidden in the ground. 
and we leave it there. Instead of making every effort to make it a part of our lives, to make Jesus a part of everything we do each and every day. I know that the Lord will care for me. doesn't matter whether my boss likes me or not. It doesn't matter whether my company is going broke. Guess what? The Lord has a plan for you. The company can go broke. Let it go broke. If they haven't been good stewards of what God has set in front of them and what is going, let it go broke and you find some place better to go. The Lord has promised us that He will provide for us and care for us as His children. Leave and depart knowing that God will provide. We are called to depart and live knowing His promises are true. All right, chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of His Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which is in Aramaic called Bethesda. This is a house of grace or house of mercy. Okay, this is what the, the original language translates to. House of mercy, house of grace. You understand how each term applies, right? Grace and mercy to give. To give something that is not earned. So this is the name of the pool, which is surrounded by five co- covered colonnades. And here a great number of disabled people used to live, uh, used to lie. And the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Uh, your version will add some other information here about the angel stirring the water. Uh, It's in the New American Standard. It's not in the NIV. There's some questions about whether that was in the original text. But the belief, whether it happened or not, the belief of the people who came to the pool of Bethesda was that if an angel stirred the water and you went down and were the first to touch the water, whatever your problem was, you would be healed. Now, wouldn't that be incredible? You know, if, if you have MS or Parkinson's or cancer or whatever, and you knew there was a play, how many of you would sit beside a pool for days waiting for it to be stirred, wouldn't you? If the water gets troubled, I'm going to be the first to jump. I'm going to lay on. Don't you know that there were some arguments about who was sitting on the edge of the water, Right? Verse 5, one who was there and had been an in, in invalid for 38 years when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Now that's some kind of question, isn't it? Do you want to get well? Really? Seriously? Jesus, what are you asking me? But you know what? As a, as, as a minister of the gospel, there are many times I appear, I, 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 I want to be baptized. I want to be a believer. I want to live my life for Christ. And then they, they go through the process and they come out the other side and nothing, nothing in their life changes. And I want to say, Don't you want Jesus? Don't you want the salvation and the hope that He has for you? And Jesus comes with this kind of question. Don't you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, verse 7, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. You know, there's this question about whether the angels really stir the water and heal people or whatever. And let me tell you something. If I was an invalid and laying beside a pool all day long and I had watched others go before me, if the results had been nothing, I would not return. I'm just saying, sometimes we question things in the Scripture and I wonder, where does our question come from? 
Why do we struggle with the fact that there were supernatural things going on in the world? It's because the reality is we don't really believe that God is working today. He's tired. He's old. That's Old Testament stuff. He doesn't really work today, does He? <laughs> what are you doing here then? Seek first His kingdom and all of these things will be added to you. See, because we hold on to things that are not true. Matter of fact, I made a note this morning. I had to do some research. You know that statement, God helps those who help themselves. You heard that before? Anybody heard that? If you heard it before, raise your hand. Let me see. See, that, that's everybody. Well, most of us are. Yeah, God helps those who help themselves. Now, most of the time, Ben Franklin gets uh, credit for this in, uh, in a 1756 almanac, right? But the reality is, he, Ben Franklin didn't say that. Matter of fact, I've heard two preachers say that Ben Franklin said, Ben Franklin did not say that. He quoted it. He didn't say it. It's not a Ben Franklin statement. It was actually about a hundred years before that, a man named Algernon Sidney in an article titled Discourses Concerning Government in Another Country. So that tells me Ben Franklin was widely read. You know, Ben Franklin said some good things though. Love your enemies, for they tell your faults to everyone. Isn't that true? I thought that was a pretty good statement. Love your enemies, for they... Now that part comes from the Word, right? Love your enemies, for they tell your faults to everyone. That's a good thing to remember, isn't it? He also said... Well done is better than well said. Don't throw stones at your neighbors if your own windows are glass. That's pretty good too, isn't it? And we hold on to those kind of things and we think they're real. You know, cleanliness is next to godliness. By the way, that's not in the Bible anywhere. You know, I don't know how many people grew up thinking things like that were in the Bible. Guess what? It's not in the Bible. Now, we can give good biblical concepts of why being clean is a good thing, but it's not in the Bible. And we really doubt that God is moving and preparing for us good works to do in this life. And that's a promise that He's made to us. Verse 7, one more time. So the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured and he picked up his mat and walked. Brethren, we, we miss something here. When Jesus says, when God gives a command, it's not just a command, it is the power to achieve what He's told you to do. For He's not given us a spirit of timidity, but one of power and of self-discipline. And so, when He gives to us the opportunity to make a difference, don't doubt that you can make a difference. Don't doubt that you can change someone's life. Don't doubt the power that is in God's living Word. Believe and take. Get up and walk. Get up and depart. Head for home. Head to see the change. Head to receive the promise that God has given you. And the man picked up his man and he walked. And so often in this life, we let things get in our way and we get, oh, I just don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I could change somebody's life. I don't know if I know enough. I, don't, I, I just don't know. I, I just, I, Lord, please, I just need help. I, and he's like, I have brought you to me to achieve, to let your light shine and let your love make a difference. What are you doing with it? Get up and walk. Return home. 
see the promises come alive that I have given to you. And so today, we need to be challenged to believe and walk in faith. To receive what He has promised for us in this. And the day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. And so they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? And the man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. And later Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Jesus said to him, and Jesus' work wasn't done. Brethren, when we reach into the world, sometimes we make a difference physically in people's lives so that we can change their spiritual place in this world. Don't, don't be afraid to allow it to have a little bit of time. Jesus went looking for this man in a circumstance where He could change him further. See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Now that sounds funny, doesn't it? The man, you know, I, I'm an invalid. I can't walk. I've spent years sitting around the pool. I can't move my legs. I can't. Move. I watch other people get healed. I watch their lives change, and I've got nothing. I'm alone. I, and then along comes this man, and he heals me and makes me whole. And when he says, "Stop sinning," or something worse may happen to you, that's going to ring a bell in my mind, right? Ding, 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 ding. Yes, sir. I get it. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. And you know what? Today, we look around and we continue to make mistakes and we fall down. This is a church for imperfect people who are striving to be perfect in the Lord. Be holy as He is holy. Stop sinning. Or something worse may happen to you. Verse 15, the man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Because he, he's not a sh I'm going to tell everybody now. When my life has changed, I'm going to share the story. I'm going to share who made a difference. And that's the way we have to be. It doesn't matter what their intentions are. And he knows, he knows that they don't have good intentions. Surely he knew. Maybe he didn't know that their intentions toward Jesus was bad. Maybe he was so excited about the change in his life that he just thought it would make a difference for them too. And you know what? That's the way we need to be. Everybody we approach, everybody that we spend time with, guess what? I have had my world changed by Jesus. And He can change yours too. Let me share with you what He has done for me. And we let our light shine into the world that is filled with darkness. And so my challenge to you this morning is, do you truly believe what you know is true to the point that you'll walk it each and every day? If we can help you change your life this morning by setting it right, help you find Christ and make Him a part of your life by, by, by being united with Him in the likeness of His death, burial, and resurrection. We want to give you that cho choice. If you just need to be encouraged, if we can pray with you, pray for you about something going on in your life, a job change, uh, uh, maybe you're, you've just moved here, or maybe you're fixing to move away and we don't know yet, and it's all right, you can come tell us. God has plans for you. We want to pray with you about that. Once you come or raise your hand and I'll come to you as we stand and sing this song together.